Welcome to the Nursing Home Seed Business Hour webinar. My name is Sherry, and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Uh, I will now like turn the call over to Sarah Brinkman. Sarah, you may begin. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome to the third webinar in our introductory series for the Nursing Home C. Difficile Initiative. If you're joining us today, you've already started down the path of enrollment in the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, which is the nation's largest database for healthcare infections, healthcare-associated infections. A couple of housekeeping items to get us started. As a reminder, your phones are muted by default, and there will be a chance to ask questions over the phone at the end of the call. We do encourage you to use the chat box as well throughout. Also, please remember that we want your feedback. After you close out of today's event, you'll be automatically redirected to an evaluation. We ask that you please take a moment to complete that, after which the certificate of participation will appear for you to print or save for your records. And we've heard your feedback about wanting the slides before the webinar. A link to the slides for today's event was sent out to participants ahead of time and is also available following the link in the chat box. Some of you are joining us for the first time today. Others have been with us from the beginning of the initiative. So just a reminder of what we've covered so far. During webinar one, we covered steps one through three of the five-part NHSN enrollment process. And during webinar two, we covered the final two steps of enrollment, walked through the tasks related to facility setup, and explained the group functionality within NHSN. Each of the three states in the Lake Superior, QIN, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are tracking progress among the member facilities, but we're interested to hear from those of you on today's call about where you are in the process. So a poll is going to appear on the right side of your screen, and we'd like you to take a moment to let us know. Where are you in the NHSN enrollment process? Is it that you haven't started, that you've submitted your identity verification, you've received your grid card, submitted facility contact form and annual facility survey, that you've completed enrollment, joined the required groups, or completed facility setup and or added users to your facility. Emily, can you please prompt the poll? It looks as though we may have lost our connection to the WebEx folks. Maybe we'll come back to the poll at the end of the webinar. Emily, please let me know if you're available to do that later on. Because we have folks who just recently signed up and others who were already in NHSN prior to the project, we know that your answers to this question will vary. But as we want to remind you that October marks the first month of surveillance for this project, the poll is now on the right-hand side of your screen if you could take a moment to let us know where you're at. So because October is the first month of surveillance for this project, that means that your facility must be fully enrolled in NHSN and join the required groups by the end of October. And then the submission of October data will occur sometime in November, which we'll talk about later on on today's call. Well, while we're waiting for the results to come in from the poll, I'm going to keep moving along. We've got a lot to cover today. Just a quick note about joining groups. Each state sent an instruction guide to the facilities that were ready for this step. As a reminder, through group, the group function in NHSN allows facilities to share data with partners and agencies. So in this case, the initiative requires that you join two groups, one specific to your state and the other, which is a national group for all nursing homes in this initiative. It's important to note that by joining the groups, other facilities in the group are not able to see your data, only the group administrators. At the state level, we'll use these groups to assist in tracking data submission, and later on, once data is populated, we'll likely do some analysis at the state and regional levels. The national group will use data to establish a baseline for C. difficile in nursing homes, which has not been done before, so we're really excited that you all are going to be a part of this groundbreaking work. So that's what we've covered so far. In today's webinar, we'll focus on locating tools and resources on the NHSN website reviewing data collection forms, protocols, and submissions for C. difficile, and reviewing a sample case. At the end of today's call, we'll discuss what comes next, and I really want to stress this point. Today is just the beginning in terms of the support and technical assistance you will receive 
and data collection and submission. We want you to leave today with the basic understanding of the process, knowing that data collection begins in just a couple of weeks. However, know that you will have many opportunities in the coming months to go over this information again, and please don't hesitate to reach out to your state contact with questions. Emily, can you post the responses to the polling questions? Seem to be having a leg. Okay. While well, we're waiting for those, before we talk about how to report data to NHSN, we wanted to quickly review why you're being asked to report data to NHSN and what benefit it provides your facility. Surveillance, benchmarking, and evaluating infection prevention activities are available because it is the nation's most widely used HAI tracking system. Uh, we are going to be using it to identify the most common or most harmful infections impacting residents and staff. That's how NHSN is used nationally, and that's um, part of the reason for using it to track C. difficile, in particular as, uh, as the nation is beginning to focus on antibiotic stewardship. It allows the establishment of benchmarks and provides incredible reporting functionality, which we'll be covering later on in the initiative. And we're able to look at specific healthcare-associated infections across a number of care settings, and then you also have the ability to share data with partner facilities, such as, in this case, your Quality Innovation Network. So what is the data used for? Everyone using NHSN uses the same nationally accepted infection definition, so rates can be compared fairly, and there's some standardization for how that is done. The volume of data collected allows for the establishing of baselines for each facility type and provides comparison of infection data, which adjusts for facility or and or resident characteristics or risk factor adjustments. Data analysis allows for establishing national benchmarks to assess performance in local and national prevention efforts. Individual facilities, groups, and the nation as a whole can track infection rates over time to identify new or increasing infections or outbreaks. And baselines allow the CDC to compare current rates to a baseline and look at trends over time. Through data tracking, it's possible to demonstrate trends and improvements or areas of opportunity for long-term care facilities across the country. And comparisons are made between different facilities and geographic regions. And it finally, sharing data with others can raise awareness and motivate change, allowing the data to inform internal quality improvement. So facilities and groups can compare rates before, during, and after a quality improvement effort to determine effectiveness. The next two slides highlight reasons specific to monitoring C. difficile in long-term care facilities, which are all things that you're likely very familiar with. We know that long-term care residents are at heightened risk for C. difficile, and that cases among this population are often more severe and harder to treat, including increased chances of hospitalization, disability, and even death. We also know that, as with all quality improvement initiatives, monitoring is a key step towards improvement, allowing facilities and groups to evaluate trends which can inform infection prevention efforts. So we're all on the same page about the importance of tracking C. difficile and why we're using NHSN to do it. Now Janet is going to explain more to us behind the how of this process. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I'd just like to start by giving you a feel for how NHSN is organized. Um, NHSN is a large system that's used by many different healthcare organizations to collect healthcare associated infection data. And there's many reporting options within it. NHSN is organized into different, four different components. Um, long-term care, healthcare personnel safety, patient safety, and um, the hospital and biovigilance. Hospitals report clustered and difficile in the patient safety component, but long-term care reported in the long-term care facility component. So um, I just want to make sure that when you look at resources, you're using resources from for your for your work. Within the long-term care facility component, um, there are different modules and that you have the op you have the option to report in. Um, there's urinary tract infection, 
um, multi-drug resistant organisms and, or NVROs, and there's prevention process measures like hand hygiene. Um, Clostridium difficile is located in the laboratory identified event module. Um, this is, so I just want you to remember if you get anything out of all this organizational stuff that Clostridium difficile is in the laboratory identified event module. Okay. And so what exactly is um, a laboratory identified event? Um, the lab ID event is used to estimate healthcare acquisition, infection burden, and exposure burden rates um, of clostridium difficile. And NHSN developed a standardized way to collect the data on clostridium difficile, and they call it lab ID event reporting. It's based on resident admissions tra and transfer data and laboratory testing data. Um, it does not include clinical evaluation of the resident, and so it's a lot less labor-intensive a way to um, track clostridium difficile. So it's not the same as the clinical diagnosis of using laboratory data, and it's a, considered a proxy measure for clostridium difficile exposure. It, it only includes the test performed on the resident while they're at the facility. These measures are aligned with um, recommendations from Shia and HICTAC physician papers. And here we have um, the website that will direct you to the tools, the protocol, the trainings, and forms that you need to learn more about reporting clustered in disappeal. Notice that the tools are developed for um, M MDROs and for clustered in disappeal surveillance because they're both in the laboratory lab ID event module in, this, in NHSN, but, but we'll only be reviewing the clostridium and difficile resources. Um, when, you, when you see that more um, button, you click on that, and that will lead you to all the links. I'm going to take a moment here, and I'm going to um, oops, share my screen with you so that... Um, oops, Oh, hope I do this right. Uh, but I want you to be able to see. Um, oh, there. Oh, that went too far. Let's see what. There we are. Okay, so this is the link that I gave you on that one screen. And it's to the main website for for you for lab ID event reporting, finding the um, resources that you need. And here's some more buttons that I was talking about. And here that will open up all your training information. And um, there's three webinars here that you can look at. Um, and I'm going to be covering a lot of the information in these webinars, so that but they're always a great reference. Down here is the protocol, and this is a very detailed um, chapter from their manual describing how to do the data collection, and and all in it has all the definitions for that we'll be talking about today. And here are all the forms that you would be using. Um, the denominator we're going to be talking about the denominator form and the lab ID event form, and the, also the instructions are here as well. So and some of the, like the annual facility survey that you already completed, that's also here. And um, the supporting material, that this describes like how to do the, um, month, the map your locations that we talked about in the last one. And there's some frequently asked questions. Another thing I would want to point out about this page is on the bottom, there's a training, there's training materials that are also located in this link. There's a demo that you can use, um, if you'd like. But, and most importantly, I'd like to point out this newsletter. Um, you can get updates if you sign up for that newsletter. It comes out quarterly. And I think as, as we're kind of in the, um, beginning of reporting for long-term care, 
So I'm sure that there will be updates within that newsletter. So I'd like you to sign up for that to receive the updates if you'd like. Now I'm going to just go back to the webinar. Um, so again, these are those three trainings in case you don't find them on that web page. And I just thought I'd include them here for you to have the direct links because we'll be talking about these trainings quite a bit or the information in those trainings today. Um, so what is lab ID event reporting? Um, let's see, let's get back to where I'm at here. Um, it's, it's used to, it's clustering difficile lab ID event protocol is used to identify lab ID events. And the reporting requirements are facility-wide, so you're expected to report on all your um, on all the residents within your facility. And you'll be able to specify what location within your facility they, they are um, residing. And this is the checklist for the um, that I'm going to be going through today for the lab ID event reporting. Um, We've already talked about mapping your locations in NHSN, and and we've also talked about the monthly reporting plan. Um, so I won't be covering those today, um, but just so that you know and realize that those have to be done every month um, as you report um, your data. So today I'm going to focus primarily on entering the lab ID events in NHSN and entering the, that's known as the numerator or the, in, when NHSN calculates their rates, the event or the, uh, it, that is the um, numerator. And then the denominator is also referred to as summary data. Um, so we'll be, re, we'll be going through both of those. Um, how to submit those in NHSN and then finally, um, looking on the looking at the alerts to see if you've completed everything, and that's their alerts are available when you miss something, and it's a way to double check your work. So let's start with the lab ID event. Um, um, it's a positive. This clostridium difficile positive laboratory assay is tested on a liquid stool specimen and collected while a resident is receiving care in the long-term care facility and the resident has no prior clostridium difficile positive laboratory assay collected in the previous 14 days while receiving care in the long-term care facility. Phew, there's a lot packed into that, so um, I'm going to kind of go through that more slowly because there's a lot of information in there. So number one, only consider a sample if the lab sample the lab sample is collected while a resident is living at the long term care facility. Only consider the sample if the sample conforms to the shape of the container. In other words, um, it's a liquid stool sample. Um, only consider the sample if there's not a prior Clostridium difficile positive laboratory assay collected in the previous 14 days while receiving care in the long-term care facility. That if if you collect two, the second positive assay within 14 days is considered a duplicate, and you and they are not included in the reporting. That's very important. So. Um, when you're enrolled in NHSN, I ask you to find out what type of testing your lab does, and that's important because some of the tests are more sensitive than others, and NHSN calculations are risk-adjusted based on the type of test that your lab uses. So don't just guess or enter other. Make sure you ask your lab what kind of tests are being done. Your rates are based on the type of the test used. A positive result for a laboratory test detecting presence of either clostridium difficile toxin A and or B 
or um, immune, enzyme immunoassay or EAIA test, or a toxin-producing C. difficile organism detected by culture or other laboratory means performed on a stool sample. Um, this is known as the NAAT or nucleic acid amplification testing by PCR. Um, those are the definitions of a positive lab assay. And the most common test that I've come across when I've been working with long-term care facilities is the NAA test. So, but um, make sure you contact your lab and find that out. I'm not a microbiologist, but um, these are the, uh, I just included this chart because um, it, these are different tests that, and the, um, the toxigenic strains that are identified. So I just thought I'd include it to help you maybe identify what type of test you're using. Um, now remember, not all positive lab tests are reported in NHSN. Only consider a sample if it's collected while the resident is in the, in the facility. And don't submit a positive test from the same resident following a previous test within the, that was positive within the 14 days. Remember, that's a duplicate. Um, and this is just a visual of that. Do not report your duplicates. So here, I, that for that reason, to, to make sure that you're not reporting duplicates, it's important to keep a log outside of NHSN of all the positive Clostridium difficile tests for each resident in your facility so you can track the duplicate results and make sure they're not incorrectly entered into NHSN. So here, for example, um, you'll notice that um, 93 is the first positive test for this resident, so that's entered. The next test is on 912. That's within two weeks of the previous one, so that is not reported. The third test is on 920. Now that's within two weeks of the most recent positive test, even though it wasn't entered into NHSN, so it is not reported. Notice if you had not been keeping a log of the test done on 920, the test done on 920, it would be more than 14 days since the initial positive test, and you would have entered it into an NHSN. So it's really, I think it's important to really keep a log of this. Um, notice that now that on the 11-1, there is another positive test, and that is that's longer than two weeks, so you would report it into NHSN. Now, this is the, the um, I've already showed you, um, I've given you a tour of where to find the forms. This is the form for the um, completing the, the, the numerator or the clustered in difficile lab ID event form. So um, that's just where the instructions are and the form. Now we're going to go into entering it into NHSN. To enter the lab ID event into NHSN, you'll log into the SAMS portal using your grid card. Um, and you'll select the NHSN reporting link on the welcome page. You'll, there should, you're kind of going to be familiar with this blue bar on the left side, um, and that's on your home page. You'll click event add. And the, the add event screen will open. On the, um, this is basic infer, resident information at first that you'll be entering and fields with an asterisk are required. Some of it's pretty basic, but, um, you should refer to the instructions for, for some of the, um, fields. Um, these are a couple of the fields that I think might be helpful to refer to the instructions. Um, there's a resident type um, that short stay is less than or equal to 100 days or long stay is more than 100 days. Um, also the field date of first admission. 
Um, you need to know the definition of the date of first admission. This is important because it determines how NHSN categorizes the lab ID event. Um, this is the date the resident first enters the facility, even if the resident leaves the facility for up to 30 days. If they leave for more than 30 days, you update it to a, the more recent date. But otherwise, you would leave it the same, even if they left for a couple days. Now, the date of current admission to the facility is used to categorize whether the lab ID event is attributed to your facility or to the community. So this is another important, um, uh, important one to understand the definition. This is the most recent date the resident entered the facility. If the res resident has never left the facility, it's the same date as the date of the, um, the other date. The, oh, now it's, it's the same date as the last one we were talking about. Let's see. Now I gotta get my mouth. Date of first admission. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so the date, the, the current date, if, it, if they're more there for more than two days, um, or if they leave for more than two days and come back, then you should update the date of current admission. So let's um, let you think about this for a while. If the resident leaves the facility for 10 calendar days and returns, should the date of first admission remain the same? Should the current date of admission remain the same? If you said the date of first admission should remain the same because the resident, you're correct. The, it's because the resident didn't leave for more than 30 days. Um, and if you said the current date of admission should be updated to the date of the return, Turn to the facility, you were correct, because they left for more than two days. Okay, so now let's talk about entering Clostridium difficile event information. This is on that same window that we were working on um, admission dates. So you haven't moved anywhere within NHSN, you're just scrolling down the page. Um, you, you will have to complete the event information. When you enter the event type, um, you'll enter, lab ID event will be auto-entered into the system, and you'll enter the date the specimen is collected. And that's the date of the event. And then the, the, the specific organism type, you'll choose Clostridium difficile, the, the specimen body site system will be the digestive system, and the specimen source will be stool. Um, oh, and I, I guess I had another slide to make it more visible for you. And those are always the same for um, Clostridium difficile. Um, and you're just entering, the only thing that varies is the date the specimen was collected. Um, now for the resident care location, you will be choosing um, from the drop-down list which unit your patient is located in. And you'll also be choosing what kind of service they're um, receiving in the drop-down list. Um, if the resident has been an inpatient of an acute care location, um, they're going to ask you that and select yes if the resident has been an inpatient in an acute care facility within the past four weeks. Otherwise, you would select no. And then if the answer is yes, you will be asked um, the date of transfer. And if the patient was on antibiotic therapy for Clostridium difficile at the time of transfer. Um, so, so that's the important parts of that. And then the custom fields are optional, but it's not optional to save it. Make sure you save your work. Um, now on the long-term care checklist, that's pretty much it for entering the lab ID event. Um, now the one that the 
Next, you have to enter the denominator data. Um, there, are, there are a number of fields for the um, denominator data, and I've given you the form. The link to the forms already is in that website that I showed you, um, and the table of instructions. Um, here's the actual, what the form looks like, although I've kind of marked it up a bit. Um, so on the form, you'll notice that the middle two columns have been blocked out. This form is also used for um, collecting potty information for reporting in NHSN, and you don't need to collect those, the data for the middle two um middle two pounds. You'll be collecting information for the resident days each month, and that's the first column, and that's for each day of the month. You can see the days of the month are one, two, three, four, five. You will enter, you'll record the number of residents in the facility. You won't include residents for whom a bed is being held if they're not present in the facility. Now, the, the next column that you'll be tracking each day is the number of admissions each month. And for this one, for each day of the month, you count and record the number of residents admitted to the facility. You'll include both new admissions and readmissions. Um, and the third column is the number of admissions on clostridium difficile treatment each month. And for this one, for each day of the month, count and record the number of residents who are receiving antibiotic therapy for Clostridium difficile infections at the time of admission. Include both new admissions and readmissions. So now along the bottom of that form, you'll total, total the counts for each column. You'll only be entering the totals into NHSN. So after you total each day, well, now we're going to go into NHSN, and we'll, I'll show you how to enter the total. So back to the blue screen. Um, on that, remember the blue um, pane over on the left side of the screen. You'll look for summary data, and you click on the add. Here you'll enter the facility ID, month, and year for which the denominator will be reported. Um, and now it's a little close-up of what will open. Here's where you enter the monthly totals for the de from the denominator form that we just that I just showed you how to complete. These are just the totals. You'll be entering resident admissions, resident days, and number of admissions on Clostridium difficile treatment. Okay, so that's kind of a close-up of the form. Also on the form. Then when you enter that, a checkbox will appear for each in-plan organism for the month. So in-plan means that you completed your monthly reporting plan and it included Clostridium difficile. If it included Clostridium difficile in your monthly reporting plan, here you'll be able to check that you are going to be reporting on Clostridium difficile. So um, you'll check, just check that box. And then, if you, if, this is really important. If you didn't have any Clostridium difficile events that month to report, you want to get credit for a zero. So you want to put in no, report no events. And you want to click that box. And you want to save it. Don't forget it. Okay? So now you've added your summary data. Back to our checklist, and that's it for entering your denominator data for the month. If, now, if you forgot anything, there will be an alert for you um, on that home tab. The blue in the blue pane, there will be uh, there's a there's a the box the top box says alerts, and you will click on the alerts, and you have to resolve them before the, your data is considered complete. So. There it is. The alerts are on the top left, and, and when you click on that, it will display which alerts have to be completed, and you, you just click on those 
the little blue underlined hyperlinks to see your incomplete summary. The most common reason for alerts when you're reporting lab ID events are the missing summary data or the denominator data for the month, or your income, um, you forgot to click on the report no events when um, you didn't have any cost duty and disappeal events. So when you click, when you see those hyperlinks and you click on them, the page with the missing information will open up. And you can, for example, this is an example of if you forgot to um, report no events. So you would click on it, and in the incomplete summary data section, you would see a list of the things that you forgot, and you would click on the event, or click on the click on the link, and your reporting page would open up for your denominator data. And again, here I put my little green check there to show you that you forgot to re you forgot to click that, and you would just click it and click save, and then you've um, you've completed your your alert. So now you've resolved all of your alerts and you've submitted all your data and that's pretty much all there is to do for that, for that reporting month. Um, now it's NHSN's turn to categorize the data. Um, so in the report, NHSN will take the information that you submitted and it will um, use definite, some definitions to categorize it into different event types. Um, Janet, can I hop in for just one second? Sure. Thanks. So while we're going through the lab ID event categorization, I really want to stress this. All of this is determined based on what you've submitted on your C. difficile cases. So it's helpful to kind of wrap your head around how NHSN is going to categorize the cases, but you do not need to completely understand this, nor do you by any means need to memorize this or be able to explain this piece at this point. We will continue to review this each month as you're looking at your data to help you understand why cases fell into certain buckets. But NHSN does this categorization based on the information that Janet's already covered. That's all I wanted to add. Good point. Good point. Yeah, um, so make sure you don't have to do any of this. NHSN is doing the categorizing, and later we'll be looking at reports and determining why did, why are the rates what, what they are, and it's based on what you entered and these definitions. These definitions are all in the protocol, and um, you can kind of review them if, as you need to. But at this point, um, it's just for you to kind of have a, a brief overview. You, this, what, you've, what we've done so far is what your part in everything is and what you'll need to do. Um, and you'll gain more understanding of the reports and the analysis later on. Um, so... This is just to give you a heads up on kind of what it's about, just an introduction. So um, so when you submit a positive lab ID event into NHSN, NHSN will categorize these events. There are two categories that are based on, these are based on the specimen collection dates that NHSN assigns, and they'll assign to the reported events. One is incident clostridium difficile lab ID event, and one is recurrent clostridium difficile event. Now remember, you, you did not enter any duplicate clostridium difficile events. Those are the ones that occurred within 14 days. You don't enter those into NHSN, so we're not talking about those. We're talking about what information that's been entered into NHSN. So an incident lab ID event is any clostridium difficile lab ID event from a specimen collected more than eight weeks after the most recent lab ID event entered into NHSN 
or it's the first lab ID event ever entered into for the resident while in the facility. So that's what an incident lab ID event is. A recurrent lab ID event is a lab ID event entered between two weeks and eight weeks after the most recent lab ID event was was reported for an individual resident in the facility. So that's a recurrent one is between two and eight weeks. And again, NHSN does this classification. You don't need to do anything with it. It's automatically in their system. So let's practice. Um, NHSN classifies the lab ID event you entered based on the date of the event. That's the date you collected the sample. So if you collected it on 3-6, that's the first, oh, yes, 3-6-2015 is the first event, so that's classified as an incident event. Now then, on 4-8-15, that's within two to eight weeks since the most, so that's a recurrent event since the, it's, since the first one. It's between two and eight weeks. Now the, on 5-14, that's between two and eight weeks since the event on 4-8. So it's recurrent as well. And now 8-10, that's greater than eight weeks, so it's an incident. Now you're not going to have to do anything with these dates. NH, this is just the system that NHSN is using. So just keep that in mind. This is all automatically calculated by NHSN. And then I'm just trying to show you how they classify incident and recurrent. So NHSN will further classify lab ID events based on the current admission. Remember, we talked about the current admission. And um, that's... They, it's classified into community onset and long-term care facility onset. So when, so when assessment is collected within the first three days after the current admission to the facility, that that is categorized as a community onset lab ID event because um, it's not attributed to your to your facility. Now, if the, if the collect data, the data assessment is collected is greater than three days after the current admission to the facility, then it's a long-term care onset lab ID event. And they are also interested, NHSN is also interested in knowing if that resident has come from a, a hospital or, um, so they're, they've also further subdivided it into uh, whether they transferred within the last four weeks from an acute care facility. So that's another class, yet another classification within an HFN. Again, none of these are all automatically done based on that information you entered into NHSN, and you don't need to do any of those classifications yourself. NHSN has a report section that will... Um, automatically generate which category these these uh, the events you entered into NHSN will fall into. So you, I'm just giving you the definitions of these. You don't have to categorize them yourself. So now I'll turn it over to um, Sarah for, for, to give you a case study. Great, thanks, Janet. I'll just wait for you to pass the ball back. So we know that's a lot of information. Uh, so again, the last bit that Janet covered is information that um, that NHSN does that categorization. But I think a lot of you have had questions about what counts, kind of what counts against us, or what about cases that come from the community or from the hospital. So hopefully that helps to shed some light on how NHSN is taking that into account and then using that information to inform their data collection and reporting as well. 
We're going to walk through a quick case study. I would encourage you to use the chat box function to kind of weigh in as we go through this. Um, and I'm just going to read to you. So on April 1st, 2015, Mrs. G, a resident in your facility, had several episodes of diarrhea. The doctor was called and a stool sample was ordered for C. difficile testing. The resident does not have a history of C. difficile while in your facility and she does not have a recent history of being in another facility. The next day, April 2nd, a loose stool sample was collected and sent to the lab. The result came back positive for C. difficile toxin A. Is this a CDI lab ID event? So I'll ask you to write in your answer in chat, yes or no. Do you believe that this would be a CDI lab ID event? There's an enthusiastic all caps yes in there. That was nice. So thank you all for answering. The answer is yes. A C. difficile positive lab assay is obtained while the resident is receiving care in the facility and the resident has no prior C. difficile positive lab assay collected in the previous 14 days while at the facility. This would also be referred to as a non-duplicate lab ID event. And I see a couple of people are go-getters and they're already jumping ahead. So what is the CDI event date? Is it April 1st because that was the date the diarrhea started or April 2nd because that was the date the specimen was collected? Absolutely. So April 2nd, the date that the specimen was collected is the, the CDI event date. So now we're going to get into uh, kind of what will happen with this case once you submit it into NHSN, how are they going to categorize it? So the resident's been in your facility for more than three calendar days and has not been transferred from an acute care facility within the previous four weeks. How will NHSN categorize this CDI lab event? Will it be considered community onset, long-term care facility onset, or acute care transfer, long-term care facility onset. Great, everybody's getting that one right as well. It would be long-term care facility onset because the this is G has been in the facility for more than three days, but has not recently transferred from another facility. What if Mrs. G had spent time in an acute care hospital the previous week? How then would NHSN categorize the CDI lab ID event? Would it be community onset, long-term care facility onset, or acute care transfer? And again, it would be acute care transfer because she was transferred within the past four weeks from an acute care setting. Because Mrs. G does not have a prior CDI lab ID event, how will NHSN categorize this event as an incident, as recurrent, or as a duplicate? Again, so this would be an incident because it's been more, at least more than eight weeks since the most recent CDI lab event, or it was the first event of its kind. Great. So that um, kind of walks you through how you would, how one of your cases might be analyzed and how first how you would enter some of the data and then how NHSN will categorize the data. So we're going to open up for questions at the end, but before we get there, I want to cover a few things. So some homework for folks. This is the same homework from webinar two, but we wanted to cover it again here. If you haven't already, we want you to be working towards completing steps four and five of the enrollment process. So as soon as you receive your grid card, you should be submitting your long-term care annual facility survey and the facility contact information, which will kick off step five when you'll submit the consent forms that are signed by your facility leadership. If you submitted for your grid card a while ago and haven't heard anything from SAMS, Someone did post a question in the chat box earlier regarding it faxing in their identity verification form. 
If you are faxed in your identity verification forms and it's been a while, or even if it hasn't been a while, we encourage you to reach out to SAMS, and the contact information will be on some slides at the end of this presentation, to confirm that they received your forms. They have an automated process to email you when they receive the forms if they're submitted through the portal site electronically, but they don't have a process in place for contacting you if you, if you send them in over fax. If you got confirmation that your forms were received, but it's been more than three or four weeks since then and you haven't heard anything, we also encourage you to reach back out to SAMS to ensure that everything is still in process. We have heard of a couple of cases where folks were missing something, but they didn't get contacted by SAMS to correct that, uh, that missing information. We also want you to work on the setup for reporting. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the first step after you complete your enrollment is to take 10 minutes to join the two groups that are associated with the initiative, and the instructions for those were provided by your state QIN contact, and they would be happy to send them to you again. And then we want you to work on the, the remaining setup, so adding other users, knowing that they also need to go through the SAMS identity verification process before they can gain access to the application, and then setting up your locations and your monthly reporting plans for your facility. Some new homework for everybody to be working on. Uh, as Janet reviewed the process for determining resident days, resident admissions, and resident admissions on C. difficile treatment, we want you to be thinking about and working with your team to establish a process for gathering that information each month. You can use the NHSN denominators form, which is linked there, and we've also included the link in the chat box. Um, if you are tracking on urinary tract infections, you would want to collect that data that is not a part of this initiative. So if you're not doing that, you can delete those columns or just cross them out. And then we also want you to familiarize yourself with the NHSN lab ID event form. You can go back and collect that and gather that information at the end of the month, depending on what system you have in place. Many facilities that we've spoken with are uh, completing paper versions of the lab ID events in real time throughout the course of the month so that it doesn't take as long and you have it all ready to uh, submit when the time comes. Kind of next steps as far as the initiative goes, as I mentioned at the start of today's webinar, today is just the beginning in terms of the support and technical assistance you will receive in data collection and submission. And we hope that you're leaving today with a basic understanding of the process, knowing that data collection begins in just a couple of weeks. However, we want you to know that you will have many opportunities in the coming months to go over this information again. Starting in November, when you will be submitting your October surveillance data, we'll be offering two virtual learning labs each month, during which we'll walk through data collection and submission, review case studies, and address questions. We'll have more information coming about these calls in the next week or so in order that you can mark your calendars far in advance. But the key message here is try not to feel overwhelmed by what we've covered today. You are in good company, and we're here to support you every step along the way. Here are the contacts that I promised to be at the end for the NHSN Help Desk and the SANS Help Desk. One tip is that we have found that calling the SANS Help Desk results in a quicker resolution to your issues often than emailing does. So if you have the time to pick up the phone, you may be able to get a quicker response. And here are your state-specific contacts. If you have any questions about what was covered today or you're looking for any uh, resources, please don't hesitate to reach out. That's what we're here for. And I'll leave that final slide with the contacts up while we take some questions. I know we have a couple questions in the chat, but um, Sherry, can you go ahead and provide the instructions if there's anyone who wants to ask questions over the phone? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask an audio question, please press star and then one on your touchtone phone. To remove yourself from the queue, you can press the pound or hash key. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing any numbers. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one on your touchtone phone. Standing by for audio questions. 
Thanks, Sherry. So it came through kind of quiet on our side, so just as a reminder, it's star and one on your phone if you would like to ask questions over the audio. In the meantime, we did have a couple questions in the chat box. Um, to clarify, if your resident is in an acute care hospital setting and is diagnosed with C. difficile while there, we do not report this. Is that right? And Jean, that would be correct. Only lab-identified cases of residents while they are in your care would be reportable. Uh, will you clarify, only loose stool samples considered. It is not reportable if not a loose stool. We just got a positive on a stool that was formed. So Janet, I'm going to let you speak to this one. This one gets a little bit gray for me. I kind of read that the loose stool requirement is more to help guide in what's appropriate for testing. But if you were to test a non-loose stool, would you submit that? That should not be submitted. Um, they should not be testing uh, samples that are not loose stool. So, and the, um, the reason and for that is to try to differentiate between colonization and infection. Yes, yes. And so it's very important that um, they just submit samples that are loose stools and conform to the shape of the container. Someone else asks, if you cannot access the patient's Medicare and Medicaid number or Social Security number because of HIPAA restrictions, how do you complete the form without these numbers? I don't believe you're required to submit the Medicare or Medicaid number, but the Social Security number is a required field in the submission. Correct, Janet? Yes, I believe that's required. So, Patrice, if you are having difficulties gathering that information um, or need help explaining the reason for it to administration, I would encourage you to reach out to your state contact so they can help you uh, formulate that message. And then we do actually have an audio question. Great. Okay. From Patrice. Hi, Patrice. Well, that was the same question. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. I pushed the button as well as writing it out. So. Oh, no, no problem. So does that does that help clarifying that? Yes, I do not have access to those numbers. So it's a HIPAA issue in our building, and I cannot get that information. So I don't know how I'm going to get it. And, Patrice, which state are you in? Michigan. Okay. So I know Kathleen is on the line, so hopefully Kathleen can connect with you and their team in Michigan can help you get the information to the administrator so that you have access to what you need. Knowing that the administrator signed off to report data to NHS, then it is a requirement of the reporting. Okay. Thank you. And so, Colleen, I see your question here. You, when entering a patient, a case, a C. difficile case, you are required to provide the patient's social security number um, when you're submitting the, the data. There was also a question earlier on, and I'm going to scroll through all of your answers to the case studies to see if I can find it, uh, related to um, the denominator calculation. So, uh, Janet, can you please confirm that my answer was correct. So the question was, for the resident not including in the resident census, are we including residents on leave of absence or only on bed hold related to a hospitalization? And my response was that the denominator is only counting residents in the facility. It doesn't matter what the reason is. If they aren't there, bed holds are not included. That's correct, sir. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle says we are having, yes, so Michelle's asking about um, adding users. Is this a good time to find out how to do that? So we did cover adding users to the uh, facility through NHSN on webinar two. Uh, the slides for that and the recording are available. Uh, following the link that was included at the beginning, but I will also include, I'll put those into the chat box as well. 
Uh, they'll take you to our YouTube page, and the webinar recordings as well as the slides are available for download there. But certainly feel free to reach out um, individually for assistance as well. And Evelyn asks if there's a specific date the report will be due each month. We are asking that facilities uh, submit their data by the 25th of the month following. So for October, we'll ask you to have your data in by November 25th. For November by December 25th, which obviously makes timing difficult for the first couple months of reporting, we will be offering those virtual learning labs around those dates a little bit earlier, recognizing that we're entering into a busy holiday season in November and December, uh, but we are asking folks to do that on a monthly basis. And then part of the reason that you are joining a group is that it will allow us to see who submitted their data and reach out to facilities so that we can uh, support them in that process. Noting that it's just after the hour, we're going to wrap things up. As a reminder, when you close out of the webinar, you will be automatically redirected to an evaluation. We would really appreciate your feedback, and after you submit the evaluation, you will be prompted and receive a certificate of participation for today's webinar. Uh, this has been recorded, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording sometime next week, but if you have questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out to your state contacts. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.